So we're on this journey and we're talking kingdom. And like I said, we're not in a hurry. Um, everything we're referring to is talking about kingdom at this time. Because we really believe that the Lord's been saying to us, not just to believe in the king, but in the kingdom that's his, that's present here on earth. And just to recap for those that have not been around for a few weeks, we believe that when Jesus came to the earth, he brought a kingdom with him, but he didn't take the kingdom away with him, but left it in the hearts and the lives of people when he rose from the dead. You see, wherever there's a king, there's a kingdom. It's not rocket science. Wherever there's a kingdom, there's a king. And often what we can do is recognize the king, but not recognize the presence of his kingdom. But actually, I believe more and more as the Lord's kind of leading us through this, that what's actually going to change the United Kingdom isn't people that have a revelation of the king, but people that have a revelation of the king and the kingdom that they're now a part of on this earth. So when we look at the kingdom of God, we know that the kingdom of God belongs to anyone who's born again. Again, you can go back over the videos of the last few weeks to see this. I don't want to spend too long on it. But the Bible says that for a person to see the kingdom, you must be born again, which must mean the moment a person's born again, they place their faith in the perfect work of Jesus. Their life comes into the kingdom of God, not when they die, but here on earth. Now, the Bible also says the kingdom of God belongs to those who are poor of spirit. That means those that know their need of a saviour. It's so hard to lead someone to salvation if they don't think they need to be saved. I don't know about you, I knew I needed to be saved. I needed a saviour. And that was a poorness of heart or spirit that qualified me to come into the kingdom through the king. But also the Bible says that to know the kingdom or understand the kingdom, you have to get over yourself and come like a child. But you just need to believe what God has said he's done. And with just a heart that's not spiritually arrogant, come through the doorway of believing in Jesus into this brand new kingdom. And we were sharing the week before last, that the moment a person's saved or born again, they come into the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God comes into them. But often it's confusing because Jesus taught when the kingdom comes, it doesn't come dominating and loud. Often it comes like a mustard seed or yeast. But it comes very small, but when it's allowed to affect all of the flower of your life, it comes to possess everything and cause your life to rise like yeast causes bread to rise. So that encouragement to us there was to allow the kingdom to mix into everything. We also understand that the Bible says we're receiving an unshakable kingdom. Isn't that awesome? But as we concentrate on being citizens of the kingdom of God, not when we die, but now here in this life, we actually position our life in a place that's unshakable, unchanging, eternal. The verse that really has caught my heart over the last few weeks is Luke 12, 32. If you read in verses 31 to 32, it's when Jesus says, okay, if you want your priorities right, Here's how you have your priorities right. Don't be like those who are unsaved. Seek first the kingdom of God. But then he says this, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's great pleasure to give you the kingdom. I love those words. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to give you the kingdom when you die. It means that he's giving you the kingdom now. And when we understand that we've been brought into his kingdom, there's only one question that will take us a lifetime to answer, and that's how do we now live the kingdom out? A few weeks ago, I spoke about how Jesus brought a kingdom into being. Then I spoke about how a person enters that kingdom. Then I spoke about how the kingdom enters them. So now we're qualified to talk about how the kingdom comes from our life to affect the place that God's planted us. You see, it's our revelation of dual citizenship that causes us to be effective. But many Christians don't see themselves as citizens of another kingdom in this life. 
so they don't live true to the ways of that kingdom in this life. They have this mystical thought that one day when they die, they'll enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, when actually Jesus declares the kingdom of God is among you. Even better, the kingdom of God is within you. So today I want to begin to turn the table and say, how do we begin to release the kingdom that's in us? One, from believing that it's there, right? I had an interesting moment this Monday when I went to London. I went to the American Embassy. And uh, one of the gifts that we were able to give our children was the ability to be dual citizens. Because obviously Gina, um, by natural birth, was an American citizen and me, I was a Brit. And so um, before they're 18, you can register your child to be an American citizen <coughs> with the same rights and privileges as well as being an English citizen. So we left it a little bit late and it was funny when we were standing at the counter. I said, I want to register my baby boy. And they looked. <laughs> but what was really interesting was the moment before I stepped into the American Embassy. You see, I was in London. They'd moved the site from Grosvenor Square to Nine Elms, the new American Embassy in London. And as I went towards the American Embassy, I was the only illegal immigrant when I stepped into it. My wife was allowed to be there, Olivia was allowed to be there, and Ethan, after his swearing in, was allowed to be there. I, I, was, I was the alien. But as I stood outside the American Embassy, I suddenly had a revelation of what God's trying to explain to us. That moments before, I was standing in the United Kingdom as a citizen of the United Kingdom. But you see, the American Embassy isn't just a building. That's a piece of land that's qualified as America in England. So the moment you go through the fence or you go through the gateway, you leave the United Kingdom, though you're still in the United Kingdom, and you enter the realm of America. So in one moment, you're in the realm of one country while present in the realm of another. Isn't that interesting? So I was a British citizen with all my rights, my purple or mauve passport that meant everything. And then I stepped in through the gate that took me into the United States of America and I was just like a visitor. Oh, Gina and the, and the kids, they were treated like royalty. Me, I was just like the extra add-on that came along. And I started to realize this is exactly what happened when we were born again. Colossians says that when we were born again, we were, not will be, translated from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now this is the revelation that we need, that though we are still present on the earth, for us this morning in the United Kingdom, we're actually greater citizens of the kingdom of God mile we're present here. But if we don't realize the citizenship we have to a greater kingdom, we'll keep living out of the kingdom of our first birth. Does that make sense? Now, the kingdom of this world isn't any good. It's the kingdom of God that contains the living and the life that we need and the world needs. So what I'm believing for when I'm praying for you, Family Church, and when I'm praying for me is little by little, the Holy Spirit will keep bringing us into a deeper and deeper revelation that when we were born again, we didn't just give our lives to a king, but we came through the life of a king into a new kingdom, that right now we are citizens of a kingdom, not when we die, now, and God wants us to simply live true to the way of that kingdom in this life. And that's Christianity, in a nutshell. It's simple. It's about the king and his kingdom. When I look at the disciples in the book of Acts, I'm like, why did they see so many miracles? Why did they see so, in, so much incredible breakout of the kingdom of God? They had the same Jesus as me. But what I realized is they had a greater understanding of the kingdom that they were a part of and I desperately need it if I want to see the kingdom come through my life. You see, they weren't visitors to the kingdom of God. They were subjects of it. And wherever they went, every demon and every sickness acknowledged the knowing that they had 
concerning the kingdom their life represented. How many of us want to see sick people getting healed? I do. You know, when I read the book of Acts, it says when they turned up, the demons fled, the sick were healed, and the dead were raised. When I turn up, they put the kettle on. And I'm so bored of that. I want to begin to see the kingdom breaking out through my life and through your lives like it broke out in the book of Acts. And it's really simple. All we've got to do is stop seeing ourselves as natural mere men that are a part of this world and start to see ourselves as people that though we're in this world, we are not of this world. We now represent another kingdom here on earth It's the kingdom of God, and it's that kingdom that we believe is the true way of living. Do you know the disciples weren't actually called Christians? It was a reference made to them, and often that was belittling. Oh, you little Christs, you followers of the anointed one. They were called a number of things. They were actually not considered church. They were considered a sect because they lived so differently to how religion lived. They didn't know how to categorize them. And they called them, one of the names that they called them was The Way. Isn't that awesome? We've just been singing. You are the way. Well, they recognized themselves as the way. What does that even mean? They lived a different way of living on this earth that was so delicious, people wanted to be around it. Come on, think about the life of Jesus. The way he lived. Remember, Jesus lived a life that was the embodiment of his kingdom. Jesus lived a life where people couldn't keep away from him. Why? His life was so delicious. The the disciples had to come up with crowd control. He would attract crowds in the desert with no social media. One man living completely different to how religion lived. Come on, when we begin to live out the kingdom life, here in this life, we won't need tacky evangelism projects where we stand in commercial road and create large circles of people that are trying to get away from us. Come on, I do it. I duck into H&M when I see the crazy preacher and I come out of Primark. (laughs) And I don't feel guilty. Because that man isn't spraying liberty, he's spraying hairspray. But when we begin to realize we are citizens of a kingdom now, and in our workplaces, in our homes, in our communities, just not be fake or phony, but just begin to live from a better set of values, which is basically the life of Christ, then I believe people will come and say, Your life's delicious. How can we have a life like that? Right, okay, so the kingdom of God's in us and we're in the kingdom, which leads me to a word that some of you are going to hate. But if you master this word, you can know the life and the power of this kingdom that has no end, flowing through your life, your family, your friendships. You ready for this word? It's not very nice. In fact, it's a great word. It's just that the modern church doesn't appreciate it like it should. Submission. You see, to the degree that we submit to the kingdom that we say we're now a part of releases the degree of how that kingdom can now flow through our lives in this world. Oh, wait a moment. I was taught that God can speak through anyone. He speaks through donkeys. Correct. God can speak through whoever he likes. But when I read my Bible, the power of God only flowed through the people who were living lives that were submitted to his kingdom in this life. And like I said, I'm sick and tired of saying they're there to sick people. I want to see some people healed. I want to see people set free. I, 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 want, I, want, I want family church to be unique, a phenomenon, something that says, oh no, those people, they're here. I want us to be something different to the vicar on the corner. I'm not the vicar of Dibley. I'm a lunatic. So let me just be what I am. But I'm a lunatic for him, amen. So okay, this is where the rubber hits the road. 
Is there a clash of kingdoms when what you want to do is different to what God tells you to do? Because that's the moment you choose the power of the kingdom you're a part of. Do you know some of my favorite words are also the ones that have irritated me the most? And I found them in Luke 6, verse 46. I believe Jesus still says this to us today in love. He says, oh, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I say. Sadly, I can look back on my life and say, yeah, that was me. But I was very cheap and I was very forward in saying, Lord, Lord, you're my Lord, you're my King. But actually, to my embarrassment, when I look back, my life lived in an opposite direction to the way that the one I was calling Lord was instructing me to live out my life. So what do I do? Live in condemnation? No, condemnation's not of God. Repentance and change is of God. But we realise that there's a better way of living and we make the decision, okay, I'm going to stop living according to what I think is right and I'm going to start living according to how God has revealed is right. And as I do, everything in my world and around me will change. But it all pinnacles on this thought of submission. Will you keep being a law unto yourself? Will you keep living in one foot with one kingdom, one foot with another kingdom? Will you try to live in the best of two kingdoms? Or will you finally, because this is a work in progress, we all are, Bring your life into being a citizen of his kingdom on this earth. Not meaning that you're a weirdo walking around in a gown saying, hey, I'm of a kingdom of God. The world doesn't need any more weirdos. It needs people like you and me who know in their heart that they're no longer true citizens of this life. They represent the true life which is the life of God. And as we live out the values of that kingdom, we're living true to the grain of that kingdom. And as we do, that kingdom is able to flow through our lives, our families, our communities, and we're actually exactly no different to the first church. Except now we understand the kingdom and not just the king. Everybody still with me? I haven't confused anyone yet, right? All right. So sometimes there's a clash of kingdoms and it's about what we choose to do when God asks us to do something we don't want to do. You see, the life of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus displays to us a different way of living and it's different to the way that we've been taught. Let me give you some examples. Here's some subjects that can differ between the kingdom that you live in and the kingdom you're a part of. Forgiveness. I've got a whole list and we're going to spend weeks going over each and every one. Forgiveness. When it comes to the subject of forgiveness, God says you should forgive. That's his will for your life. In fact, one of the parables says there's ramifications if you don't forgive and you know that you've been forgiven. Oh, we don't like that stuff. We want to make the parables just fluffy stories, don't we? They're not. It's the way we live. But yet the kingdom of this world says don't forgive. Again, when you come to a moment when you have to forgive, which kingdom are you going to live true to? This week, I had a couple of opportunities to harbour hatred, to, to foster annoyance, to, to say, who do they think they are? I had, pl- I had plenty of opportunities. I had a couple of real doozies this week where someone, it was like God was saying, okay, Andy, you're preaching about living kingdom. Let me give you some opportunities to live that out. <laughs> and boy, did he give us a couple But after brewing a little bit, thinking what I would do, I said, what will the kingdom do, Lord? What will the kingdom do? All right, if that's what the kingdom will do, then that's what I do. Selflessness. One of the things of the kingdom is prefer others. But I've been raised in a world that says take care of yourself. In my formative years, I was taught in school, look after number one. But now I'm in a kingdom that says I've got to prefer others, which means I have to lay down my life for the benefit of others that are not myself. Can you see how different the kingdoms are? Honesty, servanthood. Oh, the kingdom of this world teaches success is when others are serving you. 
Yet the kingdom of God teaches to be the greatest, you have to be the servant of all. Come on, can you see how different these kingdoms are? And the church that's going to stick out and make a difference is the church that says, we're not ashamed to live in this world, but we know we're citizens of his world. So, okay, when storms and struggles come, it's what we live out of that determines what happens next. Again, when I look back at my life, I'm only in my 50s, 53 now. I look back and I actually realise some of the storms in my life, big question marks. But others, it was me. I created them. They were produced because I wouldn't live in God's way. I kept living like I wanted to live. I was living I will, not he will. And I created a storm. And as soon as I realised that, repented, got back into his way of living, the storm disappeared. But you know, actually, I think one of the things that annoys me most is that I produced storms in my life, but often they didn't just affect my life. They affected my family. They affected people around me. Because when you live in disobedience or non-submission to the ways that God's asking you to live now, often you create a storm out of that disobedience and that storm affects not just you, but others around you. Interesting thought, eh? A couple of examples of this. There's a positive and a negative. Well, they're both positive because they all end well. The first one's Noah. When you read about Noah, both of these storylines start with that God comes and reveals his ways. When you read in the book of Noah, when you read in the book of Noah, in the book of Genesis, you read about Noah. It says that all of a sudden, God speaks from his kingdom to Noah living in the kingdom of this world and says, hey, I'm going to flood the earth. I want you to highly embarrass yourself over a large period of time and I want you to build a boat when nobody knows what water is. I, I, I want you, Noah, to spend your life being ridiculed, building a boat because I have a plan of saving people and I want to use you. How many people know that Noah could have said, I don't want the job? And he actually would have lived contrary to what God was specifically asking him to do. And if he would have done that, I don't know what would have happened because all we know about Noah is he lived in obedience. But actually, when Noah said, okay, God, this is crazy, this is weird, this is going to cost me, I'm going to lose my reputation, but I'm going to live true to what your word is asking of me. Actually, at the end of the day, it didn't save him. It saved him. It saved his family. And it, it was an opportunity for salvation to anyone that wanted to be saved. You see, when we live true, so often we think it's about just us and God. When we live true to the grain of his kingdom, to the way of living that God asks us to live, to the things that the Lord's asking us to do, it's not just about us. Others are affected. I could look at this humbly and full of thanks. What if me and Gina would have turned around and said, we really don't need to be opening a church in Portsmouth? What would God have done? You, someone else. Because nothing gets in the ways of the ways of God. But I'm so glad that we didn't because we had the opportunity and what God's done in our lives in family church is amazing. I'm so glad we said yes. But also what God's done through our lives in the lives of others. You see, us walking in obedience and submission to the ways of a kingdom that you're not optionally a part of, you are a part of, has ramifications not just in the life of a person, but in everyone around them. Now here's the bottom line for those that haven't worked it out. The kingdom of God that we're a part of now, sometimes called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, is God's rule and reign in heaven and in earth. The only difference between heaven and earth is here you have a choice whether you're going to live true to it. 
Beyond the grave, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the lordship and the way of life of God. Now, I was talking to the leaders about this Tuesday morning because so often when we talk about dying and going to heaven, it's almost like we become a different person, right? Oh, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like this. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like this. So do you know what my conclusions are? When I get to heaven, I don't want to be any different to what I am here on earth. Why? Because the kingdom that waits for me there is the kingdom that the Bible says I'm a part of here. It was Jesus that said, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. So when I get to heaven, I don't want to go into year one and learn everything I should have learned here. I want to realize that I'm a part of a kingdom here that carries on when I die. And when I die and I open my eyes in heaven, don't get me wrong, I'm looking forward to seeing my mom and some friends that have gone before. But I don't suddenly want to change gear and go, whoa, how am I going to live now? Because God's going to turn around and say, well, it's the same kingdom, Andy. And I'm going to turn around and say, well, I wish I knew that when I was on earth. Well, I won't because I do. Come on, let's begin to live kingdom now. All right, you want another example? Jonah. Jonah's a good example. And it's a good example of how our life can create storms for others. You see, just like Noah, God steps into the world of Jonah and he has an assignment for him. And you can read about it in Jonah 1, verses 1 to 3. You all know the story. Most of you went to children's church. But God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah turns around and says, I don't think so. So the word of God comes and says, Jonah... This is what I want you to do with your life. This is the grain of my plan for your life. Jonah responds, I don't think so. I don't need that. Who needs that? This is what I'm going to do instead. So Jonah goes and catches a boat to a completely different place than Nineveh. Now when you read in what happens next, you've got Jonah 1 to 3 where he says, no thanks God. And then Jonah 1 verses 4 to 13 says, And God sent a storm upon Noah in the boat that he was escaping in. And things began to get very treacherous. That everyone on the boat began to fear for their life. And Jonah knew that it was his disobedience and lack of submission that was actually causing everyone on that boat to experience a storm but was nothing to do with them. Oh, some of the storms I've caused my family, but didn't need to be. Some of the storms I've caused others around me to have to live in, because they were simply the results of me not doing what God said I should do. But there's good news in the story of Jonah. They throw him off a boat. He owns up. He says, it's me. I'm disobeying God. And they all said, well, we've got a plan. And they throw him off a boat. But it's great. There's a big fish that swallows him. And you say, do you believe that? I do. I believe it all. I believe every word from the beginning to the end. I even believe the front cover because it's got holy written on it. I believe the whole thing, the maps, everything. How, I don't know. I just know if the Bible says it wasn't figurative, it happened. And so the Lord provides this experience which is called living in the belly of a well. And it's amazing how that can make you rethink how clever you are. (laughs) And so suddenly the man that says no to Nineveh is in the belly of a well going, that was a rough night for me and everybody on the boat. And here I am now in well vomit. There's no license plates floating around because cars weren't invented. I mean, I can't teach you everything. But it was horrible. And it says in that moment, you can read for yourself, Jonah turns around and says, maybe I'm not so clever. Maybe my way of living isn't the best way. And it says, Lord, I'm sorry. I turn my life back into the direction of the plans of your kingdom. At that moment, there's a horrendous well burp. And the man's projected onto the beach. I'm not saying there weren't a few carrots surrounding him. You've got to visualize this a little bit and have some fun with it. 
But it says, and then he got up and went to Nineveh. Still didn't like it. Still grumbled when God was saving people. But what he did was he brought his life into alignment with God's ways. And when he did, the storm ceased. Others being affected by the storm were saved. But also, he came into seeing God do something for the unsaved that God wanted to do. Does this make sense? So, okay, here we are. We're talking kingdom. We're talking Jonah. We're talking Noah. We're talking that this isn't fantasy, church. When we were born again, how many are born again? Give me a wave. How many have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and you're born again? Okay, so what I'm telling you, you already knew this, it's probably me that's just discovering this. That when you gave your life to Jesus, not only did he become your saviour and save you, but he became the doorway for you in this life to come into his kingdom. And now all he's expecting from you and me is for us to live true to the ways of that kingdom in this life and the one to come. Which means it's a matter of submission. This week, what are you going to do when somebody gives you an opportunity not to forgive them? What are you going to do this week when you have an opportunity to prefer someone else at the cost of your comfort? Because this is kingdom living. It's when we take the parables of Jesus for being nice stories we tell our children to the way we choose to live in this life. The moment we do that, we can change nations. Because you see, it won't be us preaching from a microphone on a stage, but us living different lives wherever God's positioned us. Lives that are delicious. Lives that stick out. Lives that make the selfish say, this is cheap, I want to live like you live. Lives that make those that refuse to forgive want to forgive because they suddenly see the joy and the peace that's with somebody that chooses to forgive. This will keep us busy, right? But when we go into the communities, are we just going to go in there, earn their trust and then preach a message on a Sunday morning that's not really going to change anything because it was never the plan of God the disciples wherever they went they changed the environment wherever they went you see when you read the book of Acts they didn't really have meetings or services like we did they just did life together loved God celebrated the communion the blood of Jesus And then later on, we began to organise meetings, get bands, buy lighting. It's not in the book of Acts. Now, I'm not saying let's stop doing it. But church can't be the be-all and end-all. It needs to be the expression of the kingdom. But it's what we're doing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It's us living our week saying, I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. I don't become a citizen of heaven when I die. I'm one now. You want to see my passport? So all that's left for me to do now, but I understand the kingdom is in me and I'm in it, that it was the Father's good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Just spend the rest of my life living out of that kingdom for everyone around me to see. Hey, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, it's an invitation that's open to everyone. He says, come into my kingdom. If you're here today, maybe a friend brought you. Maybe you're watching on a live stream. God's equally powerful anywhere. One decision he waits for from you. Will you acknowledge your need for a saviour? Will you believe that he died for you on the cross? Will you come into his kingdom? Let's close our eyes. Let's just pray this together. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. For giving your life so I could live. You are the doorway back to God. You are the way, the truth and the life. And no one can come to the Father but through you. 
today I place my faith in you because I know my need for you. And I come through the doorway of who you are into your kingdom that's always been. As I do, I am saved, forgiven, accepted, and celebrated. Thank you, Jesus. You did what I couldn't. I place my faith in you. It's my every eyes closed, every head's bowed. If you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer, there's a journey that's waiting for you. A whole new beginning, a whole new horizon that's waiting for you. Maybe you're here today and you feel a little bit like the prodigal son that you were saved, but you've just gone off and wasted it. You've left the kingdom, but now you want to come back into the kingdom and live the life you always could have lived. As I count to three, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand if that's you. Either because you've never known him or you're coming back to him today. As I count to three, if that's you, would you just lift your hand this morning? One, two, three. Anybody here? Hey, God bless you. I see that hand. That's awesome. Is there a second person this morning? And you say, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I just need Jesus. Is there a second person this morning? One brave hand's gone up. Is there a second person? And you don't know where you stand with him today. God wants you to leave with a perfect assurance of where you stand with him. One choice determines it all. We don't believe in penance or any man-made junk. Just faith in Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for this lady. I thank you today that heaven breaks out in her life. That the kingdom of God breaks out in her life and in her family. But Lord, suddenly she breathes the breath of a new day. Thank you for her, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.